Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Raghavan Srinivas and uh, welcome to this observability panel um, on uh, cloud native and Kubernetes uh, and really uh, talk about some of the observability trends, uh, both from a tactical perspective, how as uh, a developer you can kind of um, um, start using them right now, but also from more a strategic perspective of how this is going to look uh, long term. Um, obviously, as all of us know, um, you know, observability is, uh, you know, probably as uh, popular as Kubernetes these days. Um, so uh, a lot of, lot of uh, um, you know, interest on observability, a lot of activity, uh, sometimes a lot of overlapping, uh, you know, um, activity as well. Uh, but, but I have a great panel with me. Uh, who can help clear those things. Uh, and, and uh, you know, let me go around and kind of introduce the panel. Um, starting with myself, uh, I work for, um, you know, Datastack, but I also represent InfoQ, um, and I have a bunch of uh, interests, uh, but primarily in the inner loop of uh, development. Um, how can you do this over and over again? And observability is very, um, you know, key to the inner loop because uh, you know the more uh, signals you have, the better it is, the faster it is, and and helps developer productivity. Hi, I'm Liz Fong Jones. I'm a principal developer advocate at Honeycomb.io, which is a observability vendor, and I really enjoy helping site reliability engineers and software engineers become more productive in their daily jobs. Perfect. Hi, my name is Bartek Botka, and I'm principal software engineer at Red Hat. My role at Red Hat is to really bind all those uh, observability silos that we used to have, logging, metric, and tracing, into combined and uniform uh, experience. Um, but I'm also interested in programming, in particular in Golang. I'm writing my book with O'Reilly uh, about that, and I'm also active in the CNCF space as observability tech lead, stack observability tech lead, and Prometheus and Thanos maintainer. Perfect. Josh? Hi, I'm uh, Josh Surrett. Um, I'm uh, working at Google currently, Google Cloud. I'm responsible for telemetry collection within Google. Um, I am, uh, at heart, I'm a programming language nerd. So I love Rust, I love Scala, I love like esoteric languages and really interesting things. I read lots of theories, but I really care about developer productivity and that's why I'm into observability. Um, I'm a uh, open telemetry uh, technical committee member and uh, maintain a lot of uh, observability components. So it's pretty exciting. Frederick. Hey, I'm Frederick. Um, I'm the founder of Polar Signals, uh, where we do continuous profiling. Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, my interests are um, uh, anything in observability, really. And kind of for the past five, six years, I've worked on everything that's kind of the intersection of Kubernetes and observability. So um, I'm also a Prometheus maintainer. And uh, so a lot of the things that touch both the Prometheus and Kubernetes ecosystem, I've probably had my hands on. Uh, so I'm a Prometheus maintainer. I'm also the tech lead for uh, Kubernetes SIG instrumentation. Um, and yeah, I'm in a past life, I was also a security researcher, but um, that's, uh, that I usually just observe from the distance these days. And yeah, anything distributed systems I'm interested in as well. Essentially what we are talking about is forensics in terms of observability. Um, and, um, you know, with, with respect to that, um, you know, what, what exactly does forensics mean in the context of observability and, and how do you, um, you know, kind of prepare for the unknown unknowns? Um, so, so if you can go around the table and, and, and talk about, um, you know, uh, some, maybe an example in your previous life or now, um, which, which kind of uh, helped you. Uh, clarify, you know, what, what this exactly means, uh, because a lot of people are, you know, honestly kind of wondering what this exactly means, uh, observability forensics. So Liz, do you want to go first? Sure. So I think the thing that really blew my mind um, and opened my eyes to the possibility of what observability could do was when I was a site reliability engineer for one of the Google storage systems, I got introduced to this idea that you could 
click on like and, and explore um, from a you know metric type graph and look all the way down into what is the trace that exemplifies this behavior? How can we understand what happened under the hood? And this idea of not needing to write additional code, write additional instrumentation, and to have insights into something that already happened in the past, that really blew my mind and kind of got me started down this journey of thinking about unknown unknowns, thinking about how we answer questions that we didn't anticipate when we originally wrote the code. Anybody else who wants to take a stab? Hey, Josh. I think I, I can. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I can take a stab. So uh, for me, um, also a, a Google example, I was uh, maintaining a project on um, Google Assistant, actually. And we were having issues where every time we demo to our VP, it was very slow. Uh, and we needed to go figure out why uh, specifically that device was very slow. And so actually we had observability signals in place to go kind of identify the subcomponent in this giant complex system of thousands and thousands of different you know, subsystems uh, where the particular problem could lie. Uh, and then we did some further instrumentation to investigate it. Um, but uh, for me, the, the interesting, interesting thing about observability that I think is a hard balance is uh, actionable observability, right? Like observability is always tied to you doing something that makes something better. And uh, that's been kind of my focus with observability. And it's, it's really interesting to see that kind of take place. We we're able to drop our 99th percentile latency by about half. Um, via this exploration because we found, you know, a particular subsystem that actually just had one really bad behavior for a particular class of user, but it was hidden in the statistics. Gotcha. Sort of, Frederick, uh, maybe you, you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of what's already been said, I, I agree with. And there's a kind of a saying um, also in the, in the Prometheus ecosystem that I think kind of... Um, it doesn't really uh, just apply to metrics, but uh, the saying is kind of like instrument first, ask questions later, right? And I think uh, all of the examples that we've heard so far already kind of apply to this, right? Um, this data didn't come out of nowhere. Someone did go ahead and instrument this, but the um, really interesting thing that we could do because of that is um, in various situations, we could now pull up this data that we didn't even anticipate could have been um, important uh, for for that situation, right? And I think this is the powerful um, thing about observability. And maybe plus plus one uh, from my side on both what what Josh and Frederick said around actionable observability. Like you need to ask yourself if you want advanced forensics, right? Like, is it, do you really need that? Uh, to need uh, do you need to know about everything what is happening in the, your application? I believe that you can kind of define set of patterns, set of good uh, methodologies like use golden signals or uh, red method where every component has those uh, basic instrumentation uh, either out instrumented by in application code or using some magic tools like eBPF or some auto instrumentation outside. But at the end you have consistent uh, statistic from each component that then you can reuse, you can rely on but it doesn't mean you need to know about every single function call all of the time in the past, right? So I would say there's always a place for balance here. Perfect. Um, let me go to the next question, which is really, you know, um, I know that there are a lot of, um, you know, technical, um, you know, efforts that are happening, um, but it's not all about technology. We know that, right? Uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's about culture as well. Um, but, but, a uh, couple of questions here again. Um, one is, um, you know, uh, is, uh, you know, Kubernetes, you know, with, with, with its adoption, you know, is it helping the open telemetry efforts uh, or is it really, you know, you know, not necessarily hurting, but, but you know, making it more complex. Uh, and the second part is, uh, you know, how does, you know, the technology kind of fit into the culture? Um, you know, if you can talk uh, about both of those, that'd be great. Uh, so let's start with um, Josh. Sure. Um, my answer is going to be that I think Kubernetes is actually doing both. Um, what Kubernetes does is it makes complex systems easier to create. 
um, and it kind of simplifies them so that you can actually build a, a huge distributed platform and just more easily manage it. And so what that what that does is it actually puts more pressure on observability to actually answer the complexity of these systems that are now easier to create. So observability is that natural solution of, okay, I have a system that's now more complex. Um, how do I observe it? And Kubernetes is also trying to answer that challenge uh, via various technologies. And if you look at the CNCF portfolio of observability solutions, I think you're seeing all the key ones in there. Um, so I would say that a, a little bit of this is both. We're doing more complex things and we need more complex observability to answer the uh, answer that call. I think there are a couple of ways that Kubernetes makes it easier. Um, in particular, the adoption of service mesh technologies alongside Kubernetes has really accelerated making distributed tracing available out of the box. I also feel like the easy ability to run agents as sidecars in Kubernetes makes, again, adoption and standardization a lot easier. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would yeah, agree, right. uh, especially with the standardization aspect that Liz was just saying. I think um, Kubernetes essentially has given, given us a common language that we can talk about, right? And this is not even just about observability, but this is just kind of the effect of Kubernetes in general, right? Kubernetes is kind of the same wherever you implement it. And so namespaces are the same, pods are the same. And when you talk about this um, to, to people, everyone uh, speaks the same language. And so if we, that naturally kind of uh, goes over into observability as well. And just having that common language allows us to uh, standardize so many things, right? And I think this is extremely powerful as well. Yeah, I, I don't have very much to add on those those words. Like it's essentially a huge opportunity uh, from Kubernetes side to create abstractions that allows us to, you know, standardize metadata and, and the ways we observe stuff. So that's incredible. But the question is Kubernetes helping standardizing observability effort can be also answered in obvious yes, because it makes things more complex. So it demands more observability. So people have to find something out. So I think it, it, it helped with innovation and, uh, and just um, you know, community effort in this space. So that's great as well. Okay, and, and I, I completely get the fact that you know, standards definitely help here. Obviously open telemetry is like the second most popular uh, project in CNCF behind Kubernetes, right? We all know that, uh, but really, um, you know, uh, open telemetry is uh, so broad and yet application development is so narrow, right? So in other words, if I am a Perl programmer, right? And, and as strange as it may seem, uh, there was some noise about kind of creating a Perl language working group, right? So what do you, how do you, how do you address these edge cases? You know, standardization is great, but, but you know, unfortunately we live in a world where, you know, everything is not standard, right? And what about the non-Kubernetes? Uh, language specific rust scala josh i know that you know you are a scala fan right um how do how do you how do you kind of support those different uh, development platforms per se um let's start with uh bartek this time if you have any thoughts sure yeah i think it's a complex problem and that's why we see a lot of effort from open telemetry to really drive into supporting so many different languages and building communities around that and i think this is really really uh, important you know one way is to just maybe reduce the number of languages we use right that would be nice <laughs> but the other part is that yeah. you know Fortunately, fortunately, we are standardizing the data format. We are standardizing how backends looks like, how the query languages looks like, how alerting looks like. So we already abstracted away from instrumentation. That instrumentation is the only thing that has to happen in a specific languages usually. Uh, so that's you know all, already smaller piece of work. And also there are lots of tools that allows us to be very uh, implementation code agnostic, like service meshes, uh, eBPF, which is emerging. All those are opportunities for any abstracting that away, so making sure there's less work there. So I think we are innovating in this space too. Okay. Um, Liz, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. I think that we need to support developers in adding instrumentation to their code. Right, like no matter how good the automatic instrumentation is, there are always going to be properties you may want to filter or break down by. 
that are specific to your application. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of this balance between easy and out of the box, which service meshes can do, but also like, you know, yes, your most common language frameworks should support open telemetry or other open standards out of the box. And you should be able to kind of annotate things you know, it should be unthinkable to check in code without instrumentation in the same way that it would be unthinkable to check in code without comments or tests. But that requires all of those languages and frameworks to support the standards. Gotcha. Josh? Yeah, I think to double down on that discussion is um, there's, a, there's an aspect of this that needs to target actually application developers uh, with observability. Instrumentation, uh, really rich instrumentation is expensive. And we're seeing solutions like eBPFF that, that can make it simpler for things like traces from somebody who doesn't necessarily own an application or this out of the box, you know, agent based. But what what I think uh, where open telemetry wants to be in five years is kind of targeting the underlying applications, underlying open source frameworks that people use to develop applications with built in signals, with built in standards of like, here's the bare minimum for observability. Let's make sure everybody's at that bare minimum. And that really takes targeting developers so that developers are providing the observability for operations as opposed to starting from the op side. So I think that's kind of the shift that we're seeing right now. Uh, and that's, that's, that's done through stability, stability and protocols, right? So Josh, to summarize, uh, are you saying that, you know, from an ops perspective, uh, you know, observability is further along than from a developer perspective? Uh, is that reasonable? Yeah, I think I think from a developer standpoint, there's there's a lot uh, there's a lot less unification or a lot less common standards. You know, if you if you look at like the Prometheus ecosystem, for example, there's a lot of things targeted at ops and targeted at adapting existing applications into Prometheus, um, as opposed to those applications directly providing, say, a Prometheus component or a um, open telemetry tracing export or something like that, right? I think we're going to start to see applications providing the observability as part of their own you know, profile, instead of having to look to the observability solutions for adapters. I think that's the shift that I'd like to see going forward, you know? Yeah, this is coupled a lot to kind of this DevOps idea of shifting effort left, right? Of doing this earlier, getting quicker feedback cycles. Um, I'm really curious though, to hear from Bartek about kind of the Prometheus angle around kind of how has Prometheus been perceived in the past with regard to kind of ops and dev audiences? Yeah, I was going to ask the same question to Frederick. Let me, let me give him a chance here. Um, you know, I know that he has also done Prometheus maintenance, right? So, and still maintaining it. So yeah. um, I think uh, Josh basically said that you didn't take care of application developers. <laughs> so how do you, how do you address that criticism? <laughs> So I, I actually think um, it's kind of the opposite, the, the, the other way around, right? I think uh, Prometheus adoption happened because so many people built exporters and uh, the like in-process instrumentation followed. And so I think um, open telemetry is kind of on a similar path, but kind of um, is starting immediately with the um, with the application instrumentation. I think, uh, we've talked about service meshes um, a couple of times today. I think that's kind of um, a, a parallel here where service meshes do the automatic thing. That's kind of the parallel to the exporter in Prometheus, I would say, where someone else has done the work for you. It's maybe not perfect, but um, it gets you pretty far and it uh, gets adoption going. Um, and then um, the, the in-process uh, instrumentation is the thing that actually gives you really powerful insight. And so I think... Um, this is not necessarily clashing. I think there's parallels that we can see here. Um, but I, I did want to um, pick up on the uh, on the earlier point of the standardizing the protocols. I think this is actually incredibly powerful for all of those edge cases that you were talking about. Um, for example, there was a really great case by PingCap where they noticed that the standard um, Rust uh, open telemetry uh, library was just not performant enough for them. Um, and they could cut away a bunch of uh, use cases from that library to make it much more performant for their very special case, right? Um, but they were still speaking the same protocol. And so they were able to tailor very closely to their use case. It's maybe not a general purpose library, but it's good enough for them. Um, and that's why I'm so such a big believer of um, open, open standards and the wire protocols being um, standardized. 
maybe yeah. maybe to add on top of that like some small words like I think yeah standardization helps because then you know people developers can build their own you know uh, client support but I think the one maybe advantage where what Prometheus used to have or like already has still I think the client is so much simpler because it's just HTTP endpoint versus you know telemetry you need to have like much more complexity built to the client. So there is much more work. That's why it's so harder to do. Obviously there are benefits of that, right? Uh, of this push model, but you know, one of the benefits of pull model is just extremely easy to implement on the client side. So, you know, that was easier for community to build and adopt as well. So there might be some, some differences here. Great. Um... Uh, the the next question that I'm going to ask, which is, uh, I think we, we kind of alluded to that is, um, you know, what do you say to folks who think that emitting more data will help in the, you know, in the observability forensic, so to say, you know, really observe more than what you need, um, you know, seems to make sense. But is there a point where it's too much data? And I think, uh, you know, some of you alluded to this, you know, observability might get very expensive, right? Uh, where do developers or, you know, sysadmins kind of draw the line? Um, you know, when is too much, really too much? I think there are a couple of ways to solve this. One of which is that sampling can be really, really effective for ensuring that you are, for instance, keeping every error, but you're keeping only one out of every thousand successes to kind of get a representative sample of varying categories of data that you might care about. Um, I think I worry a lot more instead about the amount of duplication. Um, if people are trying to emit data both to, you know, a logging platform and a tracing platform and a metrics platform, right? Like at what point do we say like enough is enough, yeah, you know, more data is not necessarily helpful, right? It's better to have kind of fewer higher quality signals and kind of trying to get one of everything. Um, you know, and I think that the developer experience that we're aiming for is kind of making it so that developers don't have to worry too much about adding instrumentation. It should be a consideration of, you know, how do we filter it down the line um, for how, how we keep it cost effective. Okay. I, I, do you I, want to go next? I want to do like plus okay, one to, to what Liz said around uh, the tooling side. So developer should not really decide about that. It should build instrumentation and, you know, negotiate with sysadmin and through uh, standard tooling into how much data we want to get from in particular moment from particular services. So ideally everything is dynamic. I wish I could just enable some, you know, more uh, sampling on tracing side just for one hour when I want to debug right now, right? So you have lots of flexibility using this kind of tooling. So that's the answer on the developer part. Um, and I really, I'm, I would love, I love the idea of bringing this logging metric and tracing signals. All of this is a little bit duplicated data. So if we could just reduce and maybe decide either you use logging or I, you use just tracing. So you're already from three, three things, you have only two that's already a significant amount and some mitigation to this problem of overall too much data. Yeah, I'd like to echo into that with uh, what we see in open telemetry instrumentation right now is there's a goal to have uh, a, an instrumentation API that will extract all of traces, logs and metrics kind of with, with a single hook, if you will. Uh, but the other, the other problem that we have is how much attributes and kind of data to attach to the telemetry that you're generating and how configurable does that need to be, right? So to some extent, the instrumentation, because it's expensive to write initially, should have everything instrumented and everything as possible to extract. But you don't want to pay that cost all the time. You know, you 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 only want to turn that on when you need it because if we did everything, it'd be way too expensive. So uh, I think what you'll see going forward is exactly what Bartek's talking about. There'll be a baseline that's good enough for a lot of your standard questions and you'll be able to go in and richly configure more and more data coming out going forward. I think the synergy of feature flagging and observability is really, really powerful, right? To be able to configure your you know, debug levels almost, whether it be your logging debug levels or whether it be on the metric side, adjusting the frequency of collection 
or on the tracing side saying, do you really need like all of your HTTP client? Hey, I issued a DNS request, right? Like, you know, I think that we're not talking about, you know, configuring on and off things like, you know, application developer supplied application key value pairs, right? Like those are going to be important regardless, but I think it's kind of those finer grained, like, you know, do you really need a, a trace span for everything? Okay, Frederick, any um, supporting talks or, you know, I, mean, I, talks? I don't think I have much more to add, but uh, I, I do think this is a really difficult thing. Uh, and I don't think there is a clear, um, clear answer to this even because even, even if uh, we had tools like we just described where we can switch things on and off, we don't necessarily have that for the past then, right? And so uh, that's kind of what we talked about observability being um, valuable for earlier already. So it's kind of a, a paradox almost, right? So I think it's a really difficult thing to make the right decision on. I would say there's also definitely a progression of, um, of people and their observability data. What I've seen often, I maintain a project uh, called Coop Prometheus, where there's a, a very large um, amount of data out of the box in, uh, in your Prometheus that is collected from Kubernetes components. And frankly, most, most users that are just starting out don't understand much, much of this data, right? Um, and um, as they use it more, they start to start to figure out which data is um, useful to them. So I think there are definitely also um, just sometimes you need to be a little bit pr pragmatic about do I even understand all of this data? And if not, maybe it's not all that useful for you right now. And then you kind of as you learn more, you may add more data. I think this can be useful as well. Perfect. Um... I had a couple questions more, but but I think we are kind of hitting um, you know the end. Um, so I will kind of combine those two. You know, although it's probably not a good idea to combine questions, but I'm going to do it anyway, <laughs> right? Um, for somebody you know who's kind of starting new on observability, you know, how do you kind of you know uh, get them to walk, crawl, run, right? Um, the second part is um, you know what's the most difficult unsolved problem in observability? <laughs> that will be, need to be solved in the next five years. So maybe if you don't want to look five years down the road, maybe two years down the road, right? Um, I will go around, uh, start with uh, Friedrich, um, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I, I think the, the biggest um, challenge I see for us going forward is uh, mostly a cultural one, I think. Um, first of all, like we, like, observability is definitely still growing and a lot of companies still aren't even when i talk to uh people in the community some companies still don't do any monitoring right like it's pretty crazy like we're all in kind of a bubble where we we think everybody's uh, an expert in all of these things and uh, i think there's still a lot more education of the market uh, that needs to be done and i think uh there's also kind of that this culture change that needs to happen in the entire community where yes, uh, like logs, metrics and traces are really useful signals. But I think, um, and this is partly why I founded Polar Signals, um, I think there's so much more data out there that we may be missing out on that uh, can shed a light on uh, different nuances of our systems, right? Like logs, metrics and traces have certainly been extremely valuable, but uh, I think it's primarily humans uh, liking the number three that we kind of settled on this, right? I think there's so much more uh, useful data out there uh, that, that can be useful to understand running systems. Cool. Josh, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think that you, you need to start where you are. And I think there's a lot of good adaptability. Like the, the space is pretty complex right now. There's a lot of decisions you have to make. So, um, you know, it, w am I going to do metrics? Am I going to do logs? Am I going to do traces? Maybe pick one. Yeah. And my recommendation is actually um, logs and metrics or logs and traces, specifically because you can monitor kind of SLOs and, and uh, understand when systems are going slow and then dive into root cause. And that's a decent start, right? And then from there, kind of expand. You know, event, if, if you talk about crawl, walk, run, crawling is just, um, can I deal with a system that goes down? And running is, can I evaluate whether or not a feature I just released improved my business, right? Okay. And like to go from A to B is a journey and you shouldn't expect to be able to answer B 
just because you have observability, you need to actually go through all the steps to go from, you know, just doing kind of ops based uh, reactionary actions to getting to those business based, I can actually understand features that I released and how they impact my bottom line with the same kind of instrumentation. Anyway. Great. Uh, Bartek? Yeah, so from my side, I, I definitely agree with my uh, with Josh and, and Frederick. Uh, but around the, the unsolved problems, I see big data kind of being a problem and kind of distribution of this data. So we are, you know, talking, we are in the KubeCon conference now and talking about um, you know, clusters, but already we see uh, so much variety of different use cases where clusters are so small and running in some IoT devices around the globe, and they are under like uh, unreliable networks or or even robots or you know microwaves with with stuff. And I I wonder if one of the unsolved problem is to make sure that the observability for those things. Um, you know, we, we have tools that that also work for those cases, right? For um, something outside of the cloud bubble, I would say. So, and, and we're talking about the large amount of data, data and different um, collection pipelines and, and who knows, maybe different signals, but being able to, to, to use, uh, you know, similar uh, systems, similar methodolo methodologies that everyone knows um, that works for those variety of different cases and with amount of the data that we, we collect every day, um, this, requires lots of innovation and, and, and work. Liz, I'll give you the last word. Yeah, I think actually the thing with regard to crawling that many people are not doing yet is shortening their release cycles. It's really challenging to get good observability if you're not able to get the instrumentation that you need deployed into production alongside your, alongside your code, right? Like if it's taking months for you to release new software, you need to focus on that first and not necessarily on observability would be my advice. Um, with regard to kind of the future challenges, I think the main thing that we're grappling right now with is this proliferation of definitions of observability, kind of, of observability washing. And I really worry that the word observability is going to be confused in the market in the same way that the word DevOps gets applied to everything. Um, and I think that'll really hold people back from achieving these best practices around being able to debug and known and known problems. So I think that's what we need to focus on as an industry over the next couple of years is really kind of standardizing. What does it mean? How do we do it? Thank you, Liz. Uh, I think that's a wrap. I uh, really want to thank you all for listening to this uh, panel. And I really want to thank all the panelists for their, um, you know, esteemed opinion. Um, you know, I know this is a space that's uh, going to grow quite a bit. Um, and again, thanks for listening. Um, and have a good rest of the conference. <laughs>